All right, welcome back to the channel, everyone. Uh, today, we are going to do a reaction to something that popped up on my feed here, and I wanted to check out with you guys. Um, this one's a Mike Korzimba video. Um, it's called, He Played Dirty and Ruined the End of Kobe's Career. So I don't know what this is all about, but I am intrigued to see what the premise is. Uh, so let's check it out together. If you haven't checked out Mike Korzimba, Looks like he's got a lot of subs, uh, but go ahead and check him out if you like the video. And uh, you know what to do for my channel. I appreciate everything. Um, and we blew past 10K subs, and I'm having a lot of fun. So let's continue this. Here we go. How did somebody playing Dirty end Kobe's career? Here we go. Here is the dirtiest play in NBA history. Not backing down. Maria. Oh, look at that. Oh, and it's Bynum. He will be ejected. With just that. minutes left in a blowout statement sweep over the Los Angeles Lakers in the second round of the playoffs, Mavericks guard J.J. Barea drove to the basket and Andrew Bynum struck him yeah, with an elbow cool. that was that's one of the biggest foul. Bush League things that's I've sick. ever seen. That is terrible. Bynum, I to his credit, would actually call J.J. Barea the next day to apologize. Yeah, I want to uh, actually apologize to J.J. Barea for for doing that. No, I'm just glad that he wasn't seriously injured. But the damage yeah. had been done. The Lakers went out in embarrassing fashion as shockingly, like just a minute before this, Lamar Odom had been ejected for semi-tackling Dirk Nowitzki. Your defense is now broken down and at a disadvantage. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right. Down. Went to That's the dirty, purpose. But, so a flagrant you know, two is called he's not on Lamar Odom, who is ejected. Rewind to game two, and Ron Artest also came at J.J. Barea's face. He's going to get suspended, right? Okay. You really believe that? All I right. do. That's, That's stupid. stupid. In front of millions in the playoffs, the That's Lakers stupid. disgraced themselves, and Kobe Bryant would never again reach the NBA Finals. Wow. That very season, Dirk and the Mavs would go on to beat LeBron in the 2011 championship. But here's where things would get even more interesting. As directly following this season, the NBA would have a lockout. A lockout that Kobe Bryant claimed was a direct attempt to sabotage the Lakers. Do you think the players in general in the NBA believe that the owners are losing money to the extent that they claim they're losing money? No. <laughs> no, it's laughable, actually. Everything that was done. Yeah, no, like the value of NBA teams were peaking out at that point. Done with the lockout was to restrict. Not not peaking out. They were, they were on the rise. I think they might be peeking out now because uh, when Mark Cuban sells the majority of his shares or uh, the majority of his to the Dallas Mavericks, it gets me wondering because he was talking about um, he doesn't see the NBA moving to streaming services and that's the future. Actually, it's kind of the present. So if it's regular cable TV that we got to use to watch basketball, NBA, I get what he's talking about because uh, I have to come up with my certain ways to watch a lot of games because I don't have cable TV. I don't know anybody who's got cable TV anymore. You know, like who pays for that regular service? So, yeah, they got to get on some kind of a streaming system, you know, where we can watch it. Not on cable TV. <laughs> All right. Anyways, here we go. The Lakers' ability to get players and to create a sense of parody. Kobe would say, and then the very next season, the Lakers would trade for Chris Paul and the deal would be vetoed by the NBA and mm -hmm. David Stern. With Kobe saying, the trade got vetoed because they just staged the whole lockout to restrict the Lakers. Mitch got penalized for being smart. So we're left with many questions here. Why were the defending back to back NBA champions so angry after this 2000? 2011. Okay, a little insight. I know at that time, the owner, I'm sorry, the NBA actually owned um, the Hornets. I forgot what the circumstances were, but I believe the owner got booted for something, you know, um, something bad. And the next thing you know, the NBA itself had to seize the Hornets. And at that point, they got trade. Um, they got to make decisions. So they got to veto that trade legally but let's see let's see what what, what mike has that that i don't know 
sweep. Do Kobe Bryant's allegations hold up that the league was working against the Lakers? And what exactly did the Lakers do after this series to not only ruin the end of Kobe Bryant's career, but also never give him the chance to match Michael Jordan with title number six? So what's up, Mike here, and today we are deep diving into the final years of Kobe's career in search of the truth, as Kobe's claim that the league was actively working against the Lakers is quite a big one, especially because headed into the 2000 11 season, it did look like Kobe had a very real chance of cementing his legacy by not oh, only yeah. matching Michael Jordan when it came to championships one, but also Until almost that overnight injury? after the vetoed Chris yeah. Paul trade, the Lakers went from back to back champs. Yeah, I'm sorry. Before that injury, uh, I was convinced he was going to get seven. I, I thought he was going to surpass Jordan. And at that point, I didn't like so that pissed me off but i was like bracing myself for this that like kobe's gonna be remembered as the greatest of all time but he ended up with five and it drives me crazy now because i actually like kobe and i'm wondering why is he not being remembered as even one of the greatest of all time it's it's honestly it's bullshit you know because i thought if he if he got seven that was it that was it it would be hands down Kobe's the greatest greatest basketball player of all time. I would have shut up about Jordan and say Jordan is number two. But now we're all talking about LeBron. And I don't freaking understand it. I don't understand it at all. Kobe's my number two to championship contenders to a six-year playoff drought. As remember, the 2011 Lakers were actually picked to win the Western Conference Finals, and only the Miami Heat were picked ahead of them in terms of title favorites. This team was supposed to be Kobe Bryant's version of the last dance, and Kobe was still very much in his prime. What's up, guys? With basketball season starting to heat up, it is time to turn All our right. attention to the, the sport King that matters promo. the most, and today I have teamed up with DraftKings who have a brand new way to play daily fans. Fantasy sports. There we go. And then. At just 32 years go. old, Kobe Bryant would finish fourth in the MVP voting in 2011, as he was also named first team all NBA and first team all defense. When comparing him to Michael Jordan, Jordan. By the way, y'all remember Prime uh, MVP Rose? MVP D Rose, man. Holy cow. Jordan was 32 years old to begin the 1996 season. His first full season back after his baseball retirement. And the 1996 season would give Jordan the first title of his second three-peat, which meant at the same age, headed into their respective seasons, Kobe actually held a two-title lead over Mike. Cementing yeah. his final three-peat yep. made Michael Jordan the GOAT we know today. If it wasn't for that Achilles tear, Shoot. Kobe in 2011 had a chance to replicate this as with Shaq from 2000 to 2002, Kobe had I already am. won his own first three -piece. All he needed Kobe. was one title to match Mike and Kobe made this very publicly known. This was his mission, which would make Kobe's oh, yeah. claims that the NBA was essentially out to get him in the Lakers strange. As wouldn't it be in their best interest to help prop up one of the faces of their league, one of the biggest players we've ever seen? Or were they more interested in keeping keeping Jordan as their poster child. Not anymore. It looked like they were just making room for LeBron. If I'm just being real. Sorry, I got quiet because I was just thinking about it because how did it happen? How did all this happen? They didn't want Kobe to replace MJ. Yet. They wanted LeBron to replace MJ, and they still do to this day. How did that happen? With an emerging poster child on the way in LeBron. Kobe's thoughts were given to us in an interview with GQ in February of 2015, where he said, I don't care what any other owner says. Everything that was done with that lockout was to restrict the Lakers' ability to get players and to create a sense of parity that, for the though. San Antonios of the world and the Sacramentos of the world. Even with those restrictions, the Lakers pulled off a trade that immediately set us up for a championship, a run of championships later, and which saved money. Now, 
the NBA veto that trade. There has been much speculation about this veto trade, which we are going to get into. But already, the fact that the NBA would veto the Chris Paul trade to the Lakers and instead watched as Paul became the face of Los Angeles's other franchise, the Clippers, yeah. a team that went from a valuation of $305 million in 2011 to now $4.65 billion Damn. is very interesting. And as we dive deeper into the veto, that new owner is doing well. <laughs> no wonder why he's building a new a new uh, arena, which I hear is state of the art. I I'd love to check that out. Trade. We find a lot of strangeness, as while we were told it was not fair for the Hornets because of the players involved, the story here is much more complicated. To begin, after this trade was vetoed, NBA commissioner at the time, David Stern, would say he was only generally informed about the discussions with teams. However, former NBA vice president of basketball operations, Stu Jackson, would years later claim Stern wow, ran things by me as an ex-general manager at the time. I I explained to David the following. I felt that the package of Odom, Martin, Skola, Dragic was going to vault the New Orleans Hornets to a position where they'd make the playoffs, but they were going to be a playoff team that was not capable of winning a championship. This tracks with David Stern's comments in 2018, where he said he vetoed the trade because he was protecting the then Hornets. Who oh, okay, all okay. right. Um, a little bit of context. Um at the time. The Hornets weren't really a contender, but Chris Paul was in his prime, man. And he was getting those Hornets into the playoffs every year and usually get past the first round, sometimes the second round. They were legit, but they weren't a title contender. So this statement of them getting into the playoffs but not being a contender sounds like it wouldn't really change much we need to keep in mind were being sold at the time. And while Kobe was very adamant about the league's suspicious dealings, Rockets general manager Daryl Morey, who was a part of this original trade, would decline to comment, citing the advice of counsel not to discuss details of the conversations or his feelings about the NBA's decision. To finish this off, two individuals with inside knowledge of these trade talks would say, Del Demps, the Hornets general manager at the time, said that David was briefed and that it was a done deal. Dell at regular intervals was updating NBA Vice Presidents Stu Jackson and Joel Litvin and that they told David himself throughout the day. In essence, huh. what we can gather here is that in order to sell the Hornets for more money, Stern stopped this trade and with that ended up creating oh. the parody that he wanted. The clip. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, okay. I mean, that would make sense if they kept Chris Paul. But I can't remember who the Hornets for Chris Paul, because I get it. If the NBA is trying, they they currently own the Hornets and are trying to sell the Hornets, they want max money. That's just business. But then who did they get that was that much better from the Clippers? Let's find out. Clippers would rise in the Lob City era. Yeah. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> Lob City. City. Oh my God. The Hornets would end up the getting Anthony Jordan. Davis, which we'll also get into, but Kobe and the Lakers, their last chance to win a championship was ruined here, and so was potentially Chris Paul's legacy. As if Chris Paul had played for the Lakers, his career would of course been completely different. In 2012, oh, yeah. with the Clippers, Chris Paul was named... Yeah, in his prime, dude. Pair him up with Kobe, they, they would have won some rings. No doubt. No doubt. First team all NBA, first team all defense, and he was third in the MVP voting. In 2012 with the Lakers, Kobe Bryant was named first team all NBA, second team all defense, and finished fourth in the MVP voting. There is no question that this combination of superstars would have been better than what the Lakers ended up with, as this veto trade and the trade that they would make following this would lead to their fall and a six year playoff drought, and it also would have been better for the Hornets themselves. As yeah, is, is that what led to the. Uh to the Dwight Howard and Steve Nash era? I, I'm pretty sure it is. Okay, let's see. Okay, here, I answered my question from All right. Clippers got Chris Paul, some money, and a second round draft pick. Um, They received Aminu, Eric Gordon, legit. Chris Kamen, not so much. And a 2012 first round pick. Not See, I think the Lakers trade was better for the Hornets by far, by far. 
So then what the hell? What the hell with this theory? As the Hornets ended up trading Chris Paul to the Clippers in a deal that was centered around Eric Gordon, the only reason the New Orleans Hornets were saved from this trade was the fact that they would win the 2012 draft lottery with a 13.7% chance to get the top pick, which meant the new owners were able to build around Anthony Davis, which is a big hmm. As for the Lakers' downfall, now forced to run things back with a similar team for the 2012 season. Again, Kobe was an absolute superstar. It is forgotten how great Kobe was leading up to his Achilles injury. However, Pau Gasol, the yeah, known second hit, best player on the Lakers' 2009 and 2010 title teams, had completely fallen apart on the Lakers. When it came to the playoffs in 2011, in the four-game sweep against the Mavs, yes, in game one, we did have a controversial set of calls. On one end, Pau Gasol got called for this foul on Dirk Nowitzki. Find him on the inbounds as it gets it into Nowitzki. He's uh, fouled by Gasol. The Lakers did he hit his head? I think he slapped the back of his head. Will go to the line. This led to two Dirk free throws that gave the Mavs a lead. And then on the other end, despite the fact that Jason Kidd had both of his hands around Kobe Bryant's waist, there was no Ouch. call made as Kobe would trip. And oh, then dude, Kobe would right also there. miss a game-winning three in this game one, and the Lakers would lose. From there, they would proceed to get swept as Pau Gasol averaged just 12 and a half points per game on 42% shooting to Dirk Nowitzki's 20. 5.3 points per game on 57% shooting. Then, after he was told he was traded to the Rockets and instead had to return to the Lakers in the 2012 oh, yeah. playoffs against the Oklahoma City Thunder, Powell averaged just 12 points per game on 44% shooting in a five-game second-round loss. In this same series, Kobe tried his best averaging 31 points per game, but he simply did not have the help needed, which nah, would lead job. to a complete disaster. As now, after back-to-back -back horrible playoff performances, Pau Gasol Saul's trade value had been tanked, and the Lakers' answer was to move Andrew Bynum for Dwight Howard in a complicated four-team deal. Dwight's time in yeah. Los Angeles can only be described as a time. nightmare. We actually just covered that in a recent video, but now, instead of a pairing of Kobe and Chris Paul, CP3 again was first-team All-NBA in 2013 and was fourth in MVP voting, the Lakers turned to a 38-year-old Steve Nash, whose best moment in Los Angeles was yeah, here's where it fell apart. I mean, Dwight Howard made sense because he's trying to revisit the uh, the Shaq Kobe era, but they had no idea how soft Dwight Howard really was. And yeah, he just couldn't hang, man. He was he's not that guy. You know what I mean? He's not a killer. So he just he couldn't hang with another killer. Uh, Steve Nash, man, you know, it broke my heart to see him go to the Lakers. But the year prior. He was still delivering for the Suns. So if he didn't get um, seriously injured the way he did with the Lakers, this might have worked. But where I think it all fell apart was bringing in Mike D'Antoni. I get it. Nash's prime was with D'Antoni. And that offense was run, you know, I, I get it. But that wasn't going to work with a Dwight Howard and a Kobe. I think if they would have uh, brought Phil Jackson back or not fired him like idiots, run a triangle with Nash, make Nash, you know, not only a playmaker, but make him shoot more threes because, I mean, that's perfect. You know, in the triangle offense, you give the ball down low to, to, to either Dwight Howard or Kobe in the post, one or the other, and they're both going to get double teams. Nash is sitting wide open wide open for threes and he was the most efficient three-point shooter at the time so i don't know i thought they were going to go more that direction and i thought they were going to stack rings but they didn't they went with firing the greatest coach of all time and bringing in mike d'antoni <laughs> they got what they got man was this viral video <laughs> so far. Nash would play in just 50 games in the regular season in 2013 wow. and in just two playoff games as his back injuries that had plagued him throughout his career finally caught up to him. It has actually been said that I wanted to look at this real quick. Um, all right. Let's see. All right. Points to assist. So this is when he hit his prime. And 24 and 11, 20 and 10, 18 and 13, 
I mean, okay, so see, like the season before, he didn't really decline that much. He was still getting eighteen and uh and ten. Like, like he was still performing. Look what happened here. Um but I wanted to look at his three point shooting percentage. It went down, okay. Went down to thirty eight percent by uh by twenty ten. Why is this blocked off? Why are we missing why are we missing a year here? I don't know. Okay, so his three-point shooting actually went down pretty significantly his last year in Phoenix. I didn't know that because this is what I remembered. And okay, okay, okay. That Nash's inability to play and the team struggles that followed combined with Kobe's relentless desire to win his sixth title is what caused his Achilles injury. The injury that took away the end of his career. Uh, In 2013, the year of his Achilles injury, Kobe was named to the first team all NBA for the eighth straight time. In this year, he averaged over 27 points per game. He averaged six assists per game and 5.6 rebounds. And he also finished fifth in the MVP voting. His encore production was still incredible. However, the injuries were catching up to him. These injuries were so apparent to his teammates while Kobe was still pushing himself so hard that teammates such as Dwight Howard would yell, we gotta protect him to Lakers coaches. And the coaches tried. You've got to come out. Head coach Mike D'Antoni would beg his star at the end of every first yeah. quarter. But Kobe's response was always the same. I'll tell you when I need to come out. What's it? Yeah, going for that. That's why he needed Phil. Because he actually respected Phil. And, you know, during their, their last run together, what Phil said goes. And they had, you know, they they had a harmony between the two of them, finally. So you get rid of Phil and you bring in an unproven coach, a guy who's never won a championship. You think Kobe's going to listen to him? Hell no. Important here is in the seven games leading up to his Achilles tear, the Lakers were in a battle to make the playoffs still. The Lakers, Utah Jazz, and the Rockets were all fighting for the seventh and eighth spot. And so, and real quick, this is why I respect Kobe and MJ and guys like that so much more than LeBron. LeBron just missing games left and right. Um, I saw they, they won the other night um, with a great defensive play. And um, I was looking around for LeBron. And I'm like, I don't freaking see LeBron in this highlight at the, at the end of the game. And I look it up and he's missed another game, you know. But if they don't make the playoffs, he's going to blame his team. Kobe, he put his whole career on the line just to make the damn playoffs. Just another season of making the playoffs. He put his whole body on the line, his whole future on the line. He didn't care. He wanted to win. In the seven games that he played leading up to his injury, Kobe would average 45.5 minutes per game as the Lakers were pushing. And yeah. in the final game... 45.5, so he's missing... He, he's getting subbed out for two and a half minutes per game on average at that time. That's sick. Game of the seven game stretch. Down by six points with five minutes left against the Golden State Warriors, Kobe did this. Around the back, spinning, Score! shooting, scoring! That was some play in traffic. Woo! 32 minutes. Kobe, three, yes! They get back-to-back -back stops, and Lyon again going to work, falls down. Again, he's struggling. After this horrible Achilles injury, Kobe's body had finally broken down on him, but he still showcased his unwavering toughness and desire to win, as with a torn Achilles, Kobe would walk Man. up to the free throw. I seem to be covering this moment too often, because this one hurts. A um, little side note. My torn uh, calf is pretty much repaired. I'm walking. I'm walking again. I'm doing good. Uh, minimal pain for those who uh, remember. Because this triggers that every time I see it, man. Because I don't know how he's walking. Line and knock down both free throws to tie this game. A game the Lakers would win. A game that would help them secure a playoff spot. Without Kobe in the lineup, the Lakers would get swept in the playoffs. However, we really need to think on this because in front of our eyes in the 2011 playoffs, the Lakers self imploded. Multiple of their players lost their heads as they were all ejected. Then came the lockout that Kobe said was used to restrict the Lakers from getting players. And then came the veto Chris Paul trade, okay, which I get it. if that was allowed to go through, I get it. So the narrative here is that the Lakers were becoming known as a dirty ass team, and that's why David Stern 
didn't want them to continue winning. It's not so outlandish because the trade they did with the Clippers for Chris Paul was actually worse than what the trade with the Lakers would have been. I'm not saying there's like proof here, but I get it. I, I get the I get the narrative. Kobe's extremeness in the 2013 season would never have happened. Kobe never would have averaged over 38 minutes per game in 2013. He for sure would not have averaged over 45 minutes per game to end this season. Instead, he would have been resting for a playoff run to come as the Lakers would have safely been in the playoffs with an in his prime Chris Paul. However, Kobe was on his mission to match Michael Jordan's championship resume and he did all he could. This Achilles injury would take away Away his final chance and the Lakers would end up missing the playoffs for six straight seasons Last starting Mamba. in 2014 only again making the playoffs when LeBron James finally saved them so that's our story for today I want to know what do you think in the comments down below did Kobe Bryant get a fair chance to match Michael Jordan's six titles or was there really a conspiracy in play here did David Stern successfully create the parody that he wanted by boosting up the Clippers and by boosting up the Pelicans while the Lakers and Kobe ended up getting hurt in the process. Thank you for supporting. I hope you enjoyed today's video. All right, that was a cool video. Um, all right, what do I think? I I really don't know. No, I feel like we need to discuss this in the comments. So let's talk about a couple things in the comments, everybody. Uh, first thing is which trade do you think was better for? Um, for the Hornets themselves, because, you know, for the narrative, the NBA owned the Hornets and they wanted the Hornets to be as good as possible, right? Because that would increase the value of the team and that'll increase the, the value of the sale of the team, right? More money for the NBA. Cool stuff. So that's the first question. Second question is, if Chris Paul did, if that trade did go through and didn't get vetoed, and Chris Paul was with the Lakers during Kobe's prime, mind you, do you think they would have won at least one ring? Because I think they would have won two, to be perfectly honest. I think Kobe would have got seven. Chris Paul would have had two, and his whole career would have been changed. But that's just what this guy thinks. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Let's talk about it down below. And uh, yeah, this was a video from Mike Corzimba. The link will be in the description down below. And send him some love if you enjoyed it. I did enjoy this video. And uh, yeah, shoot me a like, comment, and subscribe if you don't mind. It'll help me out a lot. And I'll see you on the next one. Peace out.